Hi, this is Carla Wills Brandon. <laughs> Just got through walking my dog and man, is it foggy outside. So for those of you who are getting pounded with snow, well, you can come dip your toe in this pea soup around here. <laughs> it's really good to talk to you guys. I thought I'd put together a quick video. Um, I did a radio show today and there'll be a link for that on my Facebook page later on in March. But one of the things that came up, one of the topics that came up was this. Will our family members, friends, loved ones, greet us when it's time for us to move on to the next dimension, to the next world of existence? What happens if that ooh, ex-husband of mine shows up? I don't want to see him. Or what about that person who hurt me so bad? The one who beat me up, molested me? No, I'm serious. These are some of the questions I get. And what I say to them is, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did a study on takeaway experiences. She sat at the bed of children who were preparing to cross over, and she spent the time listening to them. And she listened to their departing visions. Back then they were called deathbed visions. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a Swiss psychiatrist who was, was one of the first people to really put together a book on death and dying. Before that, the topic was taboo. And the only places where you could find information was from churches or other religious institutions. And sometimes some of those resources weren't that great. Well, she had a chapter in her book that was, de it was dedicated to the afterlife encounters that she heard about from some of her patients. Near-death experiences where one of her little kiddos would uh, pass away and come back and report going through a tunnel going to the other side, having what was called a life review with, with a guardian or with an angel, um, somebody who was there to support them while they reviewed their short lives and took a look at what they had learned. Uh, and then the decision was made for them to, of course, come back because they had more things to do. And as in most near-death experiences, most folks don't want to come back when they cross over. They see what it's like in the afterlife and they go, hey, this isn't so bad. This is actually better than that whole earth thing. I want to stick around here. But if their time isn't finished, if they haven't completed what it is they're supposed to complete, if they haven't learned what they're supposed to learn, then of course they make their way back. And so what she did is she documented those and she documented departing visions and she listened. And what she discovered was that those deceased or those spirit world individuals who came to escort those preparing to cross over to the afterlife were always most usually individuals where there was some, there was the connection, the bond was love. Um, so it wouldn't be somebody who had caused injury uh, to a client or a patient. It wasn't somebody who um, there was serious unfinished business with. It was somebody who the individual who was crossing really trusted and felt comfortable with. And it didn't necessarily have to be a family member. Remember, all it needed to be was someone with whom there was a love connection with, a love bond with. Then there are those individuals who are very disappointed. Um, and I found this in my investigations also. And I get this question constantly. Why, why on earth didn't my father come for my mother? You know, I would have thought that he would have been the one who would come. Why instead did her aunt come? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. And now we're going to kind of jump the broom and talk a little bit about 
spiritualism and some of the philosophies uh, that aren't real public domain. One thought is that when we cross over, we go to a dimension in the afterlife that's, that is in conjunction with where we were spiritually on this plane. So if we have been spiritually evolving on this plane, this earth plane, what's going to happen is uh, most likely we're going to end up in an afterlife dimension where we continue to evolve spiritually. If for whatever reasons we have real issue with any form of spirituality, afterlife belief, a lot of times people who have lost somebody, uh, if they don't know how to process it properly, what can happen for them is they can have a lot of anger towards spirituality. And it's about their sadness and their grief. Um, they can strike out at people like me or anybody who has information or thoughts or belief systems that deal with afterlife communication or beliefs. And so where they will go is they will go to a dimension where they can heal. They can heal from the loss. Um, it's interesting. It's been my experience that in those cases, oftentimes uh, those individuals will be greeted by the one person that they have been grieving for all of their life. Um, but then they have to go and finish up some of their emotional baggage. That's why I always tell people, look, come on, seriously, you have an opportunity here. We all have baggage, every last one of us, even me, you, you know, yours truly. And it's our job to take a look at that stuff and to do something with it. If we have, you know, anger, we need to find somebody to help us deal with our anger, beat on a bunch of pillows, write some hate letters. Um, if we have grief issues, we need to find somebody who is willing to allow us to have our grief for as long as possible. If we are full of fear, we live in difficult times right now. All you have to do is turn on the news. I have a friend in Syria, so I know what's going on with her. I've got relatives in Israel, so I know what's going on with them. And so these are difficult times. If we don't have ways to address our fear, if we can't move through our fear, what happens is that our fear, it's like a, you know, it's like the blob. It kind of ekes out into all areas of our life. And so if we cross over with a lot of fear, we may need some healing from that. My mother is a wonderful case in reference to this. I had an, an after death communication with her when she initially crossed over along with four other friends and family members in different locations. But then I didn't hear a thing from her. Nothing. Zero. I heard from other family members and friends. Uh, I had visitations, contact, all sorts of glorious things. And I kept wondering, what's the issue here with my mom? How come? No contact. What's the deal, mom? Well, I eventually did have contact. I had contact um, where she came to me, manifested with a bunch of other relatives in spirit form, and that was really awesome. Uh, and then just, I guess what, last year, she finally <laughs> came with a real personal message. She made amends for certain things that had happened, she talked about some things that she had been going through. So in essence, she needed to heal. And that's why I didn't have any contact with her for so long. So what I tell people who are upset because sitting by the bed of a loved one, say a mother, with the expectation that maybe their, their father, who's on the other side, is going to come. But then the mother starts talking about maybe... Uh, her brother and maybe her mother and then the family at the bedside is suddenly very upset because the father didn't come. No, I'm, I'm serious. This happens. Um, what I say to them is, you know what? It's not about your father not loving your mother. 
It's about your father taking care of some of the things that he needs to take care of. Tonight, I was at a gathering, and once again, I heard about how God punishes us. And this particular individual gave quite a little speech on it. And of course, I sat there and tried to not roll my eyes or uh, become visibly agitated, which often happens. Because you see, I don't think there's some God out there that's going to punish us, especially when we're getting ready to cross over. What's going to happen is that the individuals who we feel the closest to, who are in a place of healing where they can come and be there for us to assist us in crossing over, those are going to be the loved ones who will be there. Even some of our pets will show up. I wrote a whole chapter in A Glimpse of Heaven about pets. So know that there will be somebody there to greet us, that we won't be by ourselves, that even people, vets who have come back from Iraq, um, Afghanistan, have shared with me departing vision accounts or after-death communications. People from all different cultures have shared with me these experiences. These are cross-cultural. Not that long ago, somebody found out, I don't know, they found out I was Jewish. <laughs> I'm Jewish, yeah, I'm Jewish, but also I'm a hardcore afterlife believer and, and I really enjoy spiritualism. So you might call me a Heinz 57 with regard to afterlife <laughs> beliefs. But anyway, the Jewish tradition has a rich body of uh, experiences that date way back. Uh, and it talks about... Uh, afterlife communication, seeing myths leaving the body of um, dying rabbis, uh, contact from the afterlife, premonitions, all sorts of things. What happened was the Holocaust came along and, and left a lot of very hurt people, hurt people in grief. And so some of that stuff went underground, but it was always there. It never went anyway, anywhere. Well, anyway, then an individual wrote a... a a story, not a story, but an article that was published in the Huffington Post, I think, about how Jews don't believe in an afterlife. And since I have tons and tons of accounts from Muslims, <laughs> uh, uh, Jews, uh, Christians, uh, people from the Middle East, uh, cross-cultural, you name the country, I've got the account. What I did is I sat down and I wrote a blog at whitecrow.net. Uh, Actually, at whitecrow.net, if you just search Carla Wills Brandon, you'll find several articles that I put together on departing visions. The last thing I want to talk about is that there are a lot of people out there, a lot of you guys out there, who have experiences and then you don't know where to go. You don't know who to talk to. Uh, you tuck it away, uh, you feel kind of crazy, you may try to talk to um, your friends about it, your family about it, um, your clergy about it, your shrink about it, <laughs> and what happens, or even people, if you belong to a 12-step group, you try to talk to people in your 12-step group, and what you get is you get the big wall. You get, whoa. You get, ooh. <laughs> And so then what you do is you don't talk about it. You don't process it. Are you aware that sometimes when we have an experience like that, it can take us a couple of years to process it? Let me use my wonderful loving husband as an example. My husband is a child psychologist. He is a meat and potatoes Texas man. And he used to just razz me all the time about my investigations and what I was looking into and he had a near-death experience, and he also had a number of departing visions, which rocked his poor little world <laughs> to the core, <laughs> and he needed to process it. And what he did was he started taking a look at the things that he had that were about unfinished business, and he had some horrific business with the Holocaust, with family members who had passed, 
with growing up with so many Holocaust survivors who talked about the camps and such. And also, he had a lot of other things that he had never really worked through. Well, this forced him to do the work he needed to do. And in doing that, he began to feel more comfortable with where he was. So for a lot of us, what it can do is it can bring up any unfinished business we have about other areas of our life, grief, anger, sadness, fear. What it'll do is it'll force those emotions to come up. And all those little tricks that we had used in the past, whether they were addictions or uh, workaholic or super parent or whatever it was that we used to avoid dealing with what it was we needed to deal with, doesn't work anymore. And so we begin to feel depressed or we begin to feel um, weepy or we begin to feel fearful or more anxiety and we think we're really going crazy. For those of you who have had this experience, check yourselves. If you are starting to have some really strong feelings about unfinished business or, and you've had one of these experiences, what's going on is it's time for you to process the experience and find some place or someone to help you work through your unfinished business. Because what this can do, let's say that someone out there is like, wow, this whole God thing, the whole religious thing, it's so not my bag. And then they have an experience like this. And the experience proves to them, hey, wait, there is another dimension. This life isn't the end. You're going to have to take a look at your previous belief system. Or what about fundamentalists, fundamentalist Christians or zealot uh, um, peop, uh, members of the Jewish community or uh, Muslims who hijack Islam and uh, uh, misrepresent it? You know, if people like that have one of these experiences, I can tell you for a fact that that will force them to re-examine their belief system. It will force them to take a look at what's really important. It'll force them to take a look at intolerance, uh, again, fear, um, justification, rationalization, minimization for behaviors that aren't actually humanitarian. Um, along with those of us out there just kind of doing life from day to day, taking care of kids, working, dealing with day-to-day -day problems. Experiences like this will force us to re-examine ourselves. And there is nothing, nothing wrong with that. Today, my husband, he's doing just fine. <laughs> he doesn't ridicule me. When we go and we sit in Lilydale, New York in the summer, which is the home of the spiritualist movement, and you have all of these mediums running all over the place, what he does is he sits there and he listens. And I watch him listening, and it's really fun if I make contact with the afterlife because I'm, I'm too sensitive. Um, if I make some sort of contact with the spirit world or uh, if, if I've done a reading of some sort, he'll listen. He actually listens. It's kind of fun. But like myself, I also had to go through this journey. Uh, he had to clean up some of the past. So if you have concerns about your afterlife experiences and you haven't talked to anybody, not one single person, get on, get online, get online, uh, go to the International Association for Near-Death Studies. That might be your first stop to take a look at near-death experiences. There are, uh, there's also uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long. Just plug his name in. You'll find him. He has tons of information on all sorts of afterlife information. Uh, check out Dr. Raymond Moody. He's another one. He has some really great information. So there are a lot of folks out there, not just me, who have been doing this for a really long time. And oftentimes for me, I'll forget and I'll start talking about a departing vision. I'll start talking about the woman who was getting ready to cross over and all of a sudden there was a bright light 
at her doorway. And then, and her daughter was sitting by her bedside. And both of them saw somebody in the doorway. And then that person, that who, that afterlife person uh, disappeared and the mother had passed away very gently. And then the daughter ran out of the room and looked up and down the hallway, looking to see if there was anybody who looked like this individual surrounded by that white light. And there was no one, no one. Or about the family that was sitting around uh, the bed of a dying relative and all of a sudden they too began to see things, uh, see manifestation, all of them at once. Five of them saw the manifestation of a relative in the room right there. And then that suddenly disappeared and their loved one was gone. Or those individuals who will talk about a smell, the smell of roses or flowers or some sort of sweetness come into the room and uh, how it will be such a wonderful scent. And then all of a sudden their loved one who's laying there begins to smile and looks up at the ceiling and may even point and may even sit up and may even raise their hands and say, I'm ready, take me, I love you. Mother, father, son, daughter. Uh, and then they will fall black, back with a big smile on their face and die peacefully. There are so many of these different wonderful accounts. The child who has been sick for so many years, who has told his parents that he has had dreams of angels. And when he has described them, they are basically white beings of light. And he talks about how it's wonderful over there and how he's going to be okay and it's okay and they don't need to worry and he's not worried. And then one afternoon he's looking out the window and he says to his parents that he sees his angel, that there's his angel. And then shortly after that he passes. That's overwhelming. That's a, you know, it's hard enough to lose a loved one in skin. But on top of it, to have that experience, to have these experience without processing those experiences, that too can add to that sense of loss. It can feel, it can feel wonderful. It can feel heartwarming knowing that there's an afterlife. Then there's that sense of once again, one's world is rocked and they need to reevaluate how they are living their lives. There was a woman who um, brought her young daughter in. Um, her young daughter was suffering from what, what is called death phobia. And she didn't know what to do with her daughter. And when I got into the family history, what I discovered was that there, were, there was some death and dying going on in the family. And the kid, the, you know, the kid was picking up on this and didn't know how to process it. And because the mother had never learned how to process these sorts of things or even been exposed, she didn't know what to do about it. And so we talked and I talked with the child and, and uh, we had a, a wonderful time, a couple of sessions that we met. And then I suggested to the mother that she get a hold of some of the videos online that talk about these afterlife experiences and to pick out the ones that she thought were appropriate for her child and to sit with her child and to watch the videos. And do you know when that child came back for another session, that death phobia had all but evaporated? I felt really, really, it felt so incredibly awesome to see that happen. All of us should be so lucky to have a mother like that. Well, it's time for me to go. I've got to go take care of my business. I hope that I've provided you with some information that you can use. Know that you can always get in touch with me by just Googling my name, Carla Wills Brandon, on Facebook or on the web. Also, I have tons of radio shows that you can find online. Also, as I said, you can check out my blog on White Crow 
uh, at White Crow Publishing. And if you have any questions, please feel free. You can go to my Facebook page, which is all you have to do is search Deathbed or Departing Visions. And I think there's one other site on Facebook that discusses this. But my site, you'll see my pretty happy face. <laughs> so this is Carla Wills Brandon. I've enjoyed spending this time with you. And please feel free to get in contact with me if you would like to discuss your experience, if you need direction uh, on where you need to go process your experience, and I'll be glad to be there for you. Also, check out my books. I'm not very good at hawking my books, but yes, I got a whole slew of books. Um, you can buy them uh, used <laughs> uh, on Amazon.com. Once again, just you know, plug my name into the search engine, Carla Wills Brandon. Or you can plug in Carla Wills Brandon, One Last Hug Before I Go, or A Glimpse of Heaven, or Heavenly Hugs, and you'll definitely find me. Um, so thank you very much for spending this time with me. Take care. Bye.